Thanks everyone for your patience while we worked out uh, an unusual technical problem, <laughs> but I'm glad we have the sound working now. Uh, and uh, thanks also Zane and, and Marcy for, for organizing this and um, uh, also the first couple of speakers, what a great, uh, a great introduction. Um, so I'm going to dig into another uh, approach or, or general area for uh, haptics in XR. In particular, I want to talk about uh, human perceptual issues and design challenges and um, some preliminary solutions as we think about wearable tactile devices. So uh, first, I want to acknowledge the people that really uh, did this work, um, which is a um, uh, definitely a collaboration among among different labs. In particular, I want to I want to highlight my graduate students and postdocs who contributed. Uh, some of them who are now on to faculty and postdoc positions in other places. So our um, primary goal in thinking about wearable tactile devices is uh, basically to move away from the fingertips in order to make haptic devices more ubiquitous uh, for applications such as remote communication, um, in addition to the, the typical uh, augmented and virtual reality that people think about. Um, these kind of communications can also be, be between humans and agents and, and humans and robots. So um, these are all physical connections where you may want to be using your hands for other things. And uh, so we need to understand as we move tactile devices away from the body of the hands and onto other places in the body, how does that work? Now, um, let's just start with, with tactile um, or cutaneous devices in general and compare them to the traditional force feedback haptic device. I'm sure many of you are familiar with kinesthetic devices, especially in multiple degrees of freedom, like the, the phantom haptic device and its, um, and, uh, its, its progeny of, of various names. Uh, and these, of course, allow us to feel very compelling, realistic virtual environments, including shapes. Um, but this sort of gross, world-grounded kinesthetic haptic feedback, of course, is not is not the only way to go. And uh, this video, um, uh, for, for the haptics experts in the audience, I'm sure you've seen this before, uh, but for some of you who are newer to the field, this, this might be a new one. This video is an oldie but goodie. Um, it is work from Roland Johansson's group uh, from many years ago where they were studying the role of, of kinesthetic um, versus cutaneous feedback. And so what the video on the left is demonstrating is simply interaction with um, uh, picking up a match and trying to light it. Uh, I realize the video is a little bit uh, jumpy on the Zoom, uh, but the main point to take away is that this woman is great at picking up the match and lighting it. Now um, she has been anesthetized. Oops, the video on the right, I'm trying to show. Um, uh, her fingers are anesthetized and uh, she is attempting to uh, do the same task. And in this video, she struggles immensely with doing this task. She doesn't know the contact conditions between her finger and, um, and the match. And uh, she doesn't know if it's starting to slip from her grasp. And even with full vision, full dexterity, the lack of cutaneous feedback that resulted from the anesthesia has uh, meant that she um, has a very difficult time lighting this match. And uh, the old fashioned clock tells us uh, it takes her a lot longer. So I, I won't go into, of course, a full <laughs> tutorial in the time that we have on cutaneous sensing, but it is important to know that in addition to the, the kinesthetic haptic feedback that we often think about, we have many different mechanoreceptors embedded in the skin. They have different densities. They respond to different frequency of stimuli. And the types of mechanoreceptors also differ in the, uh, the glabrous or non-hairy skin of areas like the fingertip and the soles of the feet. Um, and the hairy skin, such as the back of the hand or on the arm or the, or the back of the body. Um, and uh, it's very important to understand and know about these uh, cutaneous mechanoreceptors if you are trying to stimulate them in order to provide haptic information. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're interested in doing cutaneous feedback rather than kinesthesia um, because of its importance for understanding contact conditions and, and uh, learning about a number of tasks and also to move away from the sort of heavy, large desktop mounted robot-like devices of, of kinesthesia 
Um, but we have this challenge that if we want to move away from the fingertips, we have to think about other parts of the body and what is the mechanoreception happening there. So there are differences in, in the density of mechanoreceptors. Um, another issue that I don't think we've, we've sufficiently explored, but definitely um, haptics researchers should think about, is um, the, the way in which people explore their environment. So we are very used to using our fingers to actively explore the environment. And as you move your fingers over the environment, you as, as the human can, can modulate your speed and the force and, and basically come up with an exploratory procedure famously introduced by Lederman and Klapsky, which will allow you to kind of maximize the response of the mechanoreceptors in your skin. This active touch helps us sense better. On other parts of the body that aren't really designed for this active exploration, you are more about to receive passive touch. It's wearing a haptic device, uh, that feedback just um, comes streaming into you and you don't necessarily get to create actions that, that modulate that feedback. Um, so that's another challenge that arises when we go from the fingertips to thinking about haptic feedback on the arm and other places. Um, in our lab, we are really getting interested in, in characterizing whole body haptics. Uh, the work on this page comes from uh, the thesis of my former PhD student, Daryl Dio, uh, where he was trying to think about how we might uh, mount haptic devices on various populations. In the next couple of slides, I'll get to his particular population, um, which is a patient with, with spinal cord injury. But um, we were looking at for, uh, for healthy people as well, if you wanted to think about haptic devices that were mounted on the, on the neck or the shoulders versus the arm, uh, what is the tactile sensitivity there? And one of the easiest tests to do, it definitely has its, its drawbacks, uh, but one of the easiest tests to do and is, is often used by clinicians to characterize patient groups is the Sems-Weinstein uh, monofilament test where uh, you simply have this kit of uh, handheld tools. Each one has uh, basically a little um, thin uh, wire on it, a kind of poker, um, also called a, a monofilament, uh, which uh, you push on the skin and they're designed to basically buckle at a particular load. And you go through your kit and test these different monofilaments and you see at what point can someone actually perceive the contact from the relatively small forces that come from these monofilaments. And uh, so this can be used to characterize perception with no electronic whatsoever and in the clinic, um, you know, with, with the caution that it's a, a you know, very human administered uncontrolled test. And, and so it's not maybe the, the most accurate way to measure human perception, but is a, is a great um, quick and dirty way to get started. And this just gives an example of uh, the differing force sensitivity in grams uh, to uh, uh, for healthy people um, using this uh, FW monofilament set. Uh, so quickly, just to sort of explain what we wanted to do in this in this particular case and why we we took this data is uh, that Daryl working with a patient uh, with spinal cord injury who had uh, basically an electrode array implant in the brain, which was already neural activity and allowing this patient who uh, was, you know, had no body movement from the down uh, to be able to control a cursor. And we were interested in the case of this particular subject, how can he um, move a cursor around and, and can haptic feedback somewhat, somehow help him. And this is a case where uh, the hands are out of the question uh, because of his diminished sensitivity and also inability to move on the hands. So he's using his brain to control the cursor and getting haptic feedback in the, in, on the back of the neck. Uh, and uh, I, I won't get into scientific questions about this, but it's been really interesting for us to see that um, we can elicit responses in, in motor cortex, even if we're kind of thinking and visualizing about moving a hand, but we're providing feedback in the back of the neck. Does that work? Yes. And can that feedback uh, be, be useful to, to help in um, this sort of invasive brain-computer interface control? Yes. And uh, it also could have interfered with performance, which it did not. And so just as an example of how this works, so this is not, of course, a wearable haptic device. We use the kinesthetic device to provide effectively tactile stimuli, 
where we were uh, effectively providing proprioceptive information about how he was moving the cursor in this virtual environment with his thoughts, um, such that uh, uh, we would get corresponding haptic feedback on the back of the neck, which was one of the few sensitive areas he, he had left. So I won't go into these details, but this is an interesting example of needing to characterize haptic perception on a part of the body other than the hands to see if we could provide useful feedback. Um, now that, of course, is a very specialized patient population. Uh, we, in this, uh, especially in this tutorial, are really interested in um, applications that might be more available, relevant to the general public, uh, like interacting with virtual environments. So this example is back to the fingertips. But the point here is that even with tactile devices alone, without world-grounded kinesthetic feedback, we can design wearable devices that provide very compelling uh, feedback with these environments. So in this case, we um, are uh, manipulating virtual objects, getting tactile feedback on the hands, and we found that similarly to what people can do with kinesthetic devices, just using the skin deformation at the fingertips, people can understand pretty well um, changes in mechanical parameters of objects in the environment. So what we're getting to here now is the um, idea of moving away from the fingertips in order to figure out how, uh, uh, how and when this will work. Uh, so my current uh, postdoc, uh, Mine Saric, has been looking at designing devices, for example, on the wrist that move away from the fingertips and provide these same sort of skin deformation and shear. And um, our preliminary work has shown that participants can still identify object properties. Even if we're tracking their hand and that's how they're interacting, uh, we can uh, get some information from the wrist that also lets people kind of model these virtual environments. Uh, we are certain that it's not as realistic and not quite as good as having direct haptic feedback on the fingertips, both because of the tactile sensitivity and the naturalness of active versus passive exploration. Um, and, uh, you know, and also just likely trying to, having to learn mapping between, between the fingertip and feedback on the wrist. Uh, but, but it seems to work. So, so you know, stay tuned, I think, for our more, more complete experiments along these lines. Um, but moving away from these kind of just virtual environment interactions, I also wanted to um, discuss other types of designs that get away from uh, classic kind of rigid haptic devices. And uh, this is uh, this field of soft wearable haptics, which is really interesting because uh, we would like to have wearable devices that are relatively lightweight, can be mounted on the body, and can also be comfortable. And uh, there are a few different strategies that you can consider when um, you're designing such devices. If you want to communicate a lot of information, you can think about having a small number of contacts, but maybe having uh, feedback in multiple directions, multiple degrees of freedom. Another way to think about it is that you have um, very simple haptic feedback, but you do this at multiple points, effectively uh, creating a tactile array. And uh, I think this is still also an, an open question as we, as we try to exploit the increased real estate that we have on parts of our body other than the fingertips. What is the best way to kind of utilize that real estate? Um, and given that sort of decreased haptic perception fidelity at these other locations on the body outside of the fingertip, um, it may be good to, to spread out this information uh, physically. And the extent to which that you know, works well from a practical point will, will have a lot to do with just kind of the usability and wearability of devices. So we've explored crazy ideas like having a device that grows onto your arm, uh, like the example on the left. And we do also have to consider um, comfort. So in designing uh, these soft wearable haptic devices to provide tactile feedback, um, there still needs to be some kind of ground for reaction forces. And so the design on the left actually has a, a rigid or semi-rigid exterior, um, which is required for reaction forces. And we kind of want to spread those reaction forces out on the skin so that what you notice is the contact point is actually moving 
and uh, not the, the reaction forces that are that are more spread out. Um, but this is still, I think, um, you know, an open challenge as we think about going to wearable devices. How how can we how can we do this well? Okay, so. Uh, I'd like to uh, end with some examples re related to other other applications of touch. Um, in this case, we are thinking about social touch, all the different ways in which uh, people interact um, with each other through the sense of touch. Uh, this is me stroking my husband's arm to demonstrate a, a sort of uh, communication which is very common between people. Um, which is to stroke the skin. It is sometimes used to uh, communicate calming or love or uh, reassurance. And uh, how do we create wearable tactile devices that have this kind of moving distributed contact? Well, um, one of the previous speakers started talking about illusions and, and how illusions can be useful um, and maybe in some ways essential in haptics. If you're not actually touching the real object or it is not touching you, how do we, through some kind of um, artificial device, make it feel as if uh, this thing is really happening? Um, so with uh, when Heather Culbertson uh, was in our lab, she's now at USC and you'll hear from her later in this tutorial, uh, we designed a very simple voice coil array and um, studied how far apart and to what extent the pattern of stimulation would be required to stimulate this kind of continuous stroke. Um, and this had been uh, done before, uh, for example, with Ali Israr and who will also talk later in the work in the tutorial um, with uh, devices like the tactile brush. But here we're, we're trying not to use vibrations. Um, we really want to create a, a realistic illusion of a contact point traveling over the skin. Uh, so you can do it with a very simple voice coil motors. And we also looked at patterns of other types of devices, such as a series of, of rotary motors. Um, which would um, kind of all turn in a pattern. And I think this, this next slide will, will show this better. Uh, so to create a continuous stroke illusion, you have to make decisions about um, how long are the pulses from each contact and what is the delay between them? And this is not shown on this slide, but also what is the spacing between them? And um, so Karen Nunez, along with Sophia Williams and Heather Culverson, have done an amazing job of characterizing kind of what is the spectrum of, of delays and pulse times and, and width between these uh, tactile simulators that can create the illusion of something like a continuous stroke. Um, some of these devices, like, like the one shown on this slide, are definitely not wearable, but we can use these non-wearable devices to understand what pattern should be used, and then create the minimal devices require, required for wearability. And we've uh, applied this in, in the idea of, of performing social touches. Um, so here's an example uh, with uh, my grad students, Mike Salvato and Sophia Williams. He is touching her arm to convey a social touch. We recorded on a capacitive wearable array what those social touches were like and then modeled those patterns and then uh, recreated those patterns on uh, one of these voice coil arrays. And uh, in some cases, like in the case of a stroke, figured out the patterns that would feel continuous. And uh, it, it turns out that we can, um, very close to the ability of human-human touch communication, be able to communicate emo emotions or cues like happiness, gratitude, calming, love, and uh, attention, which isn't exactly a, an emotion, but could be useful as a kind of haptic icon, uh, similar to to the um, to the kind of emojis that we that we send today. Um, and these uh, definitely map as expected to uh, various uh, uh, valence and arousal patterns that that you would get from these emotions. So. Um, in, in so revisiting this question, though, of, of arms versus fingertips, I, I want to get back to this question I mentioned earlier about, well, we, we know that, that the fingertips are going to have better perception than the arm, uh, and, and maybe social touch doesn't normally require fingertips. You want to you feel a stroke on your arm, but there are going to be other cases where we want to maximize information transfer. So I'd like to discuss another idea, which can um, basically exploit both the arms and the fingertips. 
And this is work from Sophia Williams, where she compared uh, vibrations, uh, vibration patterns that are used to convey information that are displayed to the fingertip or to the forearm or to both. And the, the longer term idea is we think about wearable ubiquitous haptic displays is that you could wear some kind of display on your arm. Um, because the sensitivity in our arm is not so great, we could get kind of initial information or initial cues through the arm. And then if the user would like to um, surreptitiously or not get more information, they can then explore the device with the fingertips of the opposite hand. So that way the fingertips are not always encumbered and the device is wearable, but we can exploit that better perception, uh, both in terms of the density of the counter and the active aspect of exploration um, of the fingertips. And uh, what she showed is for the various um, patterns that she was using to uh, uh, transmit information that uh, people were um, uh, pretty accurate uh, both in the fingertips only and the combined fingertips and forearm case. But there is a, a slight degradation in performance when you have haptic feedback through, through both channels because that may be a little bit confusing to the human. So maybe we should be thinking about if we go to wearable haptic devices, uh, things that uh, maybe provide some kind of uh, very gross kind of information uh, through the, through the uh, another body part but then uh, the user can, if they desire, rather than turning their visual attention, they could use the, the fingers of their opposite hand in order to gain more information. One other, um, I guess this is really the last example I wanna talk about as we think about wearable devices is a very different one, but as we think about tactile devices that could be used for rehabilitation, uh, this is work from my postdoc, Caitlin Sine, much of it which was done in her, her PhD at Georgia Tech, but she's continuing now on um, looking at plasticity and poor muscle tone over, over stroke and having wearable tactile devices which distribute vibration feedback in different locations on the hand as well as other parts of the body um, to see how that improves both perception and ability to move in a controlled fashion with the passive, passive tactile stimulation, which is significantly better than the control. And we don't completely know how this works yet. The underlying mechanisms are still being studied. So there's, there's open hypotheses about why this seems to help patients. But um, it is another really interesting way to think about wearable tactile devices in contrast to the rehabilitation robots, which are much more complicated and can only be used in the clinic uh, compared to other devices. So it's just another great um, application with lots of still open scientific questions of how we can use tactile devices. So with that, I would like to uh, thank all the students that did the work, our collaborators on so many of these projects, and our sponsors, and all of you, especially for your uh, yeah, patience with the initial technical difficulties. And thank you, Zane. Pass it back to you.